So I'm excited because the first reader is Martha uh, Kahane. And to introduce her, I want you to know that Martha is a psychologist in Altadena, California. She's a mother, she's a grandmother, and an avid choral singer. Martha is studying poetry with Rachel Nevins at the Writer's Studio, and her poetry has appeared in The Purple Nail and Ruth Scribe. Can I ask you, Martha, to unmute and take it away? Okay, I'm going to read three poems, and the first one is called FaceTime. The last time I saw my mother was on FaceTime when she died. Her frail ancient body, wisp of a human, lay still in the bed but not frozen, wordless and mute, but not silent. In California, I faced the end time, singing songs all the way to Manhattan, the midwife to her ending. Last winter, I sat with her in real time, touched her face, brushed her hair. She lay naked on the bed, knees bent, gazing upward, satisfied and peaceful. Your body is beautiful, I said. Really? Yes, it is beautiful in its ancientness. It is a healthy, ancient body. You could see the chapters of childbirth and lover and old woman. Yes, she said, it has been a good body. I have loved it. At the laptop, I watched her fade away, the body used up, ready to shut down, eyes closed to the ceiling, her inhale hissed strange and crackly, unstable, the death rattle like pixelated breath. Only we two present, another crackle breath, and the last breath. The next poem is called Mom, Yoke, Light, Love. I learned to scramble eggs from my mother, who was a great beauty. She'd take two eggs, crack them one, two, three, sixteenth note taps on the edge of the white bowl, and scramble with a fork as fast as she could because she had that kind of speed. After she cooked them, we'd sit down and eat them and she'd listen to all I had to say. Honey, she'd tell me your light is as bright as the yolk in this egg and she'd cast that light all through me. After she died, that's when I realized the light she cast would never leave. And now my final poem is called The Other Side. Down here on earth, we have grocery stores and love affairs, garden plots and snowstorms, toilets and telephones. Conversations there don't need words at all. And colors come alive way beyond crimson, scarlet and celadon and the love even the maddest, deepest love down here is cardboard by comparison. Now I would like to introduce Jennifer Mikowski. Jennifer is an alum of the University of Arizona's MFA program. She lives in Tucson where she teaches English to students from refugee backgrounds. She also takes the master class at the Tucson Writers Studio. Her work has appeared in Gargoyle, the Portland Review, Two Bridges Review, Matador Review, Blue Earth Review, and others. The story is called Slowly Being Erased. My best friend has no face. Most days he wears a navy blue hat pulled down over where his head should be, but beneath it there is nothing, just air. Some days he wears a gray pillowcase, some days a burlap sack. Today, for instance, he is wearing a brown paper bag with a black knit hat pulled over it to match his suit. He is medium height, 
but his hat with its pointed corners makes him seem taller. We walk arm in arm through the crowds of guests. The afternoon is quickly becoming evening, the desert heat dissolving like a vapor. The last glints of sun strike through the backyard, illuminating the cypress trees and making people into tall shadows. The yard looks like a paradise of silhouettes, flowers, candles, and blooming Palo Verde trees. The bride walks towards us. She goes from shadow to golden light, her wedding gown scarfing around her legs. From the distance, her gown looks like a puff pastry, but as she gets closer, it is gossamer and refined despite all the layers. She looks like love, her heart-shaped face, her peony colored cheeks, her eyes bright with joy. I touch her hand and she smiles. The sun flames off her white teeth. She has no idea who I am. It was beautiful, I tell her. You are so beautiful. She nods her head and I introduce her to the man with no face. She smiles and flounces off to speak to someone else. The man with no face and I crash weddings just to see what love looks like. We have forgotten. While we are not in love, we hold hands and hug each other on bad days. He is slowly disappearing. His head went first. He doesn't know what will go next. I, on the other hand, am utterly unremarkable. Vague might be a good way to describe how I come across. A man with no face says I have fuzzy edges and I sometimes blur when I walk too fast. People barely remember my face or my name or anything about me. In a way, the man with no face and I are perfect for one another. We are deficient, half-present anomalies. While we are in love with a hyper-enchanting atmosphere at weddings, when we are in the mood to go deep, we visit funerals. We cry with strangers. We laugh at the stories told at the gatherings afterwards. Later when we go home, we cling to each other and remember the stories people once told about us, but they are forgetting. We are slowly being erased. The funeral this weekend is on the south side for a man who was so popular, we can barely fit into the church. I wait in line to visit his coffin. His hands are folded neatly over his dark suit. He is wearing a cowboy hat, a half smile a turquoise rosary around his neck. I am tempted to touch it, to touch him. I want to know what it's like to be so adored, so fresh in people's minds. He left behind five daughters and three sons who wait with their mother at the front of the church. I'm so sorry, he was such a good man. I repeat nine times before we follow a procession of cars to an outdoor utopia. There are paper flowers the color of the sky, colored paper flags waving in the breeze, gilded confetti strewn across white linen covered tables and caught in the spines of saguaro cacti, making them glitter. There is a chocolate fountain set up on a patio. Chocolate was his favorite, I hear someone say. The man with no face is wearing a black Humburg hat over a black ski mask. I am tempted to kiss him, as he hands me a marshmallow covered in chocolate, but I don't. It would be strange to kiss a ski mask anyway. We join others at the table as the dead man's best friend makes a toast. He raises a glass of something amber colored that gleams as the sun shines through it. He says his friend was the life of every party and let us party in his honor. As instructed, the man with no face and I dance through the crowd. He twirls me around and around as a mariachi band begins to play. We laugh with strangers who look right through us. Later, as the, fest as the festivities die down, a woman begins to sing a slow lament in a deep throaty voice. We slow dance to her dirge, pressing into one another tightly, remembering. The woman turns to the sun, which is setting in the distance. 
Before it drops below the horizon, it seems to blind her as she squints. For a moment, it blanches her dress and her hair. Me ha olvidado, me ha olvidado mi amor. She looks spectral as she sings. She looks like one of us. Thank you. Our next reader is Cindy Wheeler. Cindy is a songwriter and poet. She has been studying at the writer's studio for two and a half years. She spent the 90s and 2000s playing in rock bands P. Shy and the Caulfield Sisters. She also did a lot of spoken word back in the day when reading poetry was called that. Here she goes again. Okay, Cindy, you can unmute yourself. I'm going to read two poems. The first one is called Prayer for Endurance. That it may please you, Lord, I will not shed a tear as this tinder box goes up into flames, even though my eyes are burning, Lord, and they have yet to see even a glimmer of the glory. That it may please you, Lord, I will forgive them. Their trespass against us does not cease. Their malice festers in my craw, Lord. Why can't the vengeance be mine? That it may please you, Lord, that although the glass is actually half empty, I will smile and nod otherwise to its half fullness. I will go along with that shit, Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm thirsty all the time. That it may please you, I will push the camel through the eye of the needle. I will put my shoulder into it and dig in, Lord. That camel bats his long lashes and then spits right in my face. I watch a rich man saunter into the kingdom. His suit smells like death and his pockets are filled with the ashes of children. Shaking my fucking head, Lord. The desert sands grow exponentially. The dunes are golden in the sun and go on for miles. I will wander there like you, Lord. But even the devil has grown bored. And the only temptation offered me is to lay down and die. And if I'm honest, Lord, I'm thinking about it. That it may please you, Lord, I'll keep walking. One foot, then the other, my idiotic grin full of sand. And uh, for my last poem, uh, this one is called My Black Hole. I have a black hole. My black hole floats and moves like a migraine aura. I keep trying to patch my black hole with duct tape and tar paper, but it can't be done. My black hole shrinks and expands in the middle of my kitchen table. I fill it with the memory of pancake mornings that never happened and the sound of my sister laughing. My black hole likes the abstract. My black hole sits in the passenger seat of my Volvo. I can't make right turns because my black hole blocks my view. My black hole is king view blocker. I can't see what's coming. So I go left and left and left forever in a circle. My black hole is also king cock blocker. Wants 14 cats instead of two. My black hole absorbs the smell of cat piss like a goddamn lavender sachet, and my couch smells fresh as a daisy. But really, it just smells like cat piss and black hole, the darkest empty smell you've never known. I taught my black hole how to play the fiddle. It harkens me back to my Appalachian roots. My black hole sings mournful bluegrass harmonies and songs of other black holes, of mine shafts, and infant graves of the empty bellies of hungry people. My black hole gets lost in the mist of the Smoky Mountains, walks itself shoulder deep into a creek and fills its pockets full of stones. My black hole goes all Virginia Wolf on itself because it feels lost all the time. Oh, my poor black hole. It is infinitely large and there just aren't enough rocks. My black hole would need an asteroid to get the job done. I want to swaddle my black hole like a baby. My black hole contains all the mysteries of the universe. I whisper to my black hole, tell me how this ends. But my black hole says, mum's the word lady. 
My black hole tells me to make myself flatter, to stay hidden between the bathroom door and the wall, quiet as a mouse. My black hole is only trying to protect me because this is a home invasion. This is a 1970s horror movie and the call is coming from inside the house. I am so frightened. I say into the phone, who is this? And a deep voice says, this is black hole. What a motherfucker. I take my black hole to LaGuardia, walk up to the Delta kiosk and buy my black hole a ticket to the Bahamas. I want my black hole to visit a blue hole. I can tell my black hole is as lonely as space without one of its own kind anywhere near. But mostly, I just want my black hole to go away. My black hole is a 1,000 year old baby, is an unaccompanied minor of a black hole. I walk my black hole down the jet bridge. I'm crying now. The flight attendant pats my shoulder and then my black hole is off and up. I know as soon as they reach the tongue of the ocean, my black hole will crash that plane, even though I implored the flight attendant not to show my black hole the cockpit. My black hole, my black hole will count to infinity before it comes up for air. Grace Chow grew up in the Bay Area, lives in San Francisco, and has been with the Writer Studio since 2016. Her stories have appeared in Necessary Fiction and Z Publishing's America's Emerging Writer series. She'll be attending the University of Oregon's MFA program as a first year fiction candidate this fall. Grace, unmute yourself. I will be reading an excerpt from my short story, Remembrance. Back when the white terror was ripping through Taipei and Tainan and dozens of other rising cities and villages that I had never set foot in, all the kids were scared that they would come home one afternoon and throw down their book bags and baseball bats and their fathers and grandfathers and big brothers who are intellectuals or had graduated from university would be gone, rounded up by police, chucked into jail for a year or two or five, where they would be starved and interrogated and bled. And their pre-existing diseases, if they had any, would slowly then rapidly bloom, unchecked, until the diseases had taken over and set fire to their entire bodies. And if they were extra unlucky, like fat little chains that the spectacled uncle had been, beaten for seven and a half minutes until the diseases had taken over and then shot squarely between the eyes, so that all 38 years of his scarlet blood and brain splattered in a dripping X formation on the wall behind him as the surrounding living men shouted, you communist, you communist, at the still bright whites of his eyeballs. Back then, we heard from little Ting, whose older cousin was a policeman, that two young men in blue Guomindong uniforms would stand, glaring erect, on either side of the doomed prisoner in every execution, one to check his pulse to make sure he was forever dead, and the other to rip up the goodbye letter he had written with pain and tears and grace and drowning sorrow to his wife and children the night before, right in front of his pulling deep brown eyes, the good six seconds before he was shot, saying, now who will remember you? When it was my father's turn, he was taken between lunch period and math period, and by the time I arrived home, my mother was crying on the tile floor, and my aunt was fanning her with the beauty magazines that my father absolutely despised, but my mother could not stop flipping through, even when she was giving the babies their daily bath or cooking dinner or pressing my father's check ties and shirts and pants. Your country has betrayed your own father, she sobbed, and her green earrings dangled to the ground and her long orange skirt was sprawled out behind her like a vibrant fallen palm. Back then, if our fathers or brothers or uncles were taken away, there is nothing we could do but tug our bleach uniforms back on at 6.30 in the morning and toss our book bags over our shoulders, which were shuddering from being sore from shuddering, and announce to Little Ching before the 7.30 flag salute with all the superiority and bravery we had left. I hope my father doesn't turn out like your uncle and watch him harden and squint and point two fingers at the beige square of flesh between our eyes. Back then, I tried not to go home right after school because my mother would be looking away, out the kitchen window and into the courtyard where my father, who had been a top history professor at the National University, used to sit and smoke his favorite cigarettes and read the morning paper. 
or my mother would be looking down at all the shimmering jewelry that she had collected from generation after generation of fashionable aunts and great aunts and worn when she had met and dated and had married my father. Necklaces and brooches and rings that she liked to lay out one by one on the silk bedspread to admire from time to time. And not even her own mother, my grandmother, who had moved from my mother's older sister house to our house the morning after my father was taken away, could get her to eat more than a teaspoon of rice or leave the house to shop at the pink boutique and have coffee at her favorite cafe or hold my brother or sister when one of them started crying and so instead of going home right away, I would sit at the yellow and white stall outside the primary school and order rice roll after rice roll, drizzled in sauce, with the money my father had placed on the chair by my bed every Saturday until he was taken away. Or I would crouch in the comic book corner of the Shoe bookshop, my scratchy blue skirt bunched around my knees, and read until I grew immensely irritated by the number of times that Popeye had to come zipping back to save olive oil, infallibly lean and stylish, the point where I wanted to scream and shred the book in front of old Mr. Sue, the thin pot owner of the bookshop. Or I would nestle inside the metal bottom of the tunnel slide at the park near my father's university and wonder if my grandmother or mother would come searching for me if one day I decided to not come home for dinner. But I was always, always back in the house and in my pajamas and cotton slippers at 6.15, setting the table for four while my father's green plastic Kyoku radio which had rounded edges and two pristine silver dials and was my mother's gift to my father during their first New Year's together, crackled blurrily in the background. Before I was born, when my father first started seeing my mother, they would write letters in Japanese and speak Japanese to each other and dine at sushi restaurants and drink at sake bars because Japan was still trying to be in charge of everything in the world. But perhaps this being in charge was not as one might think a wholly malicious thing, according to my clean-shaven father, as he wiped his brow and then his glasses with his silk handkerchief. And during their morning flag salute, when they were even younger and going to school in Tainan, it would appear as if two suns had risen, one diffuse yellow and distant, the other great red hot imminent. The second red sun, perfect in darkness and roundness, would burn during the day as my 10-year-old father, sweating and smiling in his blue and white jersey, scored a glittering home run for the little tiny and Tokyo Tigers, and the red sun would burn during the night as he gazed up at a looming poster of the blue and white Chunichi dragons, two rows of 24 six-foot-tall beasts with puffed chests and bats in hand, and dreamed that he might be one of them one day. And the red sun would burn as my 12-year-old mother, with her peach lips and black pigtails, cut short because she could not grow them any longer or they would be snipped by the stiff-faced headmistress in front of the entire sixth-grade class dance from one corner of the fabric station of the Hayashi department store to the other, skittering back and forth between the pink cherry blossom print and the lavender cherry blossom print, which she would request in girlish but fluent Japanese for the lady to measure and cut two and a half neat yards and bring back to her mother, my grandmother, to trim further and sew into her 13th birthday dress. And the red sun would burn as my grandmother stared at this rich and beautiful patterned cloth in her hands and ported and embroidered with a single metallic thread and remembered in a language that was not Japanese, the innumerable birthday portraits that my mother, slow white and pearl skin had taken while swathed in cherry blossom and arabesque and blue sea wave prints. And the red sun would continue to burn in all of its scarlet force and sweeping progress, burn brightly until finally one flashing night, this great ruby sun was destroyed and the Hayashi department store and its state-of-the-art golden elevators violently shattered, and the little Tainan Tokyo Tigers became the little Tainan Tigers, and a different, darker, more vicious force, one from our very own kind, blazed through our homes bellowing, who will remember you? Thank you. I would love to introduce our next reader, reader Anne Chinnis. Anne has been a student at the Writer's Studio since January 2017. She is an emergency physician of 40 years and currently the leadership coach and CEO of Matrix Executive Coaching. She lives in Virginia Beach, Virginia and fancies herself an angler. Go Anne and free, feel free to unmute yourself.
I'll be reading two poems this evening. The Fisherman Talks Tides, after Skeet Reese, greatest bass fisher of all times. I learned to fish from my father who had polio. He'd sit to cast cause he couldn't stand. Flick his left hand out the window of a fast moving Buick, right wrist on the wheel and snag a full belly bass one county over. When I sit on the Withlacoochee River banks before the sun burns off the night, all I need are my lures and the tide. Strung out in the grass, they look dead. But when I skim them across the moss, the yellow tail jigs and the red topped twirler bounces and I can catch anything, a feather floating, a glint, a ripple widening in the wind. You may not believe this. When my father crossed the international date line on the USS Little Rock, right before polio caught him, he trolled round Cape Horn and all the fish turned back their clocks, all the Dorado, all the tarpon, cause they knew their days were numbered. The ensigns wrote home, we are headed to Rio, gorging on mahi. They dated their postcards tomorrow and the fish swam in reverse back to their past. That's why I sit when the tide runs. The Ozarks, pop it, my pop it, catch me a thief, rubber in the juice of a walnut before I must sleep. Somewhere past Branson in the bank vault of history, my kin are ginning up again on moonshine brewed in their root cellar, scrubbing ash crosses off their noble foreheads, shoving short pistols deep in the ribs of their neighborly bank tellers. My grandfather crashing the safe store, his hands smirched by walnuts. Hungry Robin Hoods eating bank failure and shale quarried from these ore forged bluffs. The limestone erosions made fortunes amputations possible. Nail a horseshoe to a walnut tree stump regrow your luck. When I was five, I swiped a fireball from Galena seed and feed, and my granny dragged me up the courthouse stoop at high noon, made me sing to my doll with the elderberry eyes, pop it, my pop it, catch me a thief, rubber in the juice of a walnut before I must sleep. I don't know when we will have enough in this sinkhole between the James River and these weeping caves. Watch us in the 1930s, weaving Jesse James dolls from yellow hollyhock, baptizing them in the James River at moonlight, moonrise, laying dreams like borrowed pennies on the tracks by the bridge, gifting fistfuls of stolen bills to our neighbors in the courthouse square while the prisoners hum, pop it, my pop it, catch me a thief, rubber in the juice of a walnut before I must sleep. Here we are in the church by those tracks, our uncles at rest in the dust out back, sunlight streaming through the stained glass Jesus, dust motes tumbling into the collection plate, us exalting our good fortune dropping our derringers into the cradles of young Bonnies and Clydes waiting in line for the gunfight ride at Silver Dollar City, casing the place for the Branson Bell, faces hazy in the locomotive steam, bandanas snug for the heist, small hands at home hooked into holsters, walnut juice staining their pistoled palms, aching for one great escape. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our next reader, Manny Martinez. Manny is the author of the short story, Wife Beater Tank Top from Akashic Books 2020 anthology, Berkeley Noir. His short story, Poppy's Stroke and poem Fragmented 
were published in the May 2020 edition of the Ascentos Review. He publishes as J.M. Curé. Manny lives in the Bay Area, teaching high school English and singing salsa. Manny, unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, this piece is called Flagged. Flagged, one, to mark with a flag or flags for identification or ornamentation. Two, to lose vigor or strength, weaken or diminish. I held my uncle's papery hand and felt his fight waning. The machine connected tubes and the mask and the bags of liquid dripping into his body were just clues. It was how my father's brother looked at me, the man who raised me as his son. My parents were killed at a party in the Bronx when I was four and I barely knew them. I knew my uncle Gene, Theo Gene, Don Eugenio Torres. His look was one of pending departure. He sidelined his plans to return to Puerto Rico so he could bring me up in the city his brother loved more than life. For all the glorious things he boasted about his patria, he felt I was probably better off here. I suppose he was right. I stayed out of jail and out of trouble. His daily sage advice, which I took to heart. I earned a bachelor's degree from NYU and a master's from Teachers College Columbia. I made him proud. He told me so often. Uncle Gene vowed to get back one day and retire. By the time cancer claimed him, it was too late. He pressed my hand. He was saying something I couldn't catch through the oxygen mask. What, Theo? I said, leaning in. No quiero morir aquí, he said. I don't want to die here. My heart sank. I knew here did not just mean the hospital. Don't worry, Theo, I told him. We'll get you back there, I said. His thin smile cut through the lie. He closed his eyes. I needed a smoke. I walked to my car and got in the driver's seat packed a bowl and thought about my uncle's words, his look, his smile. I thought about how I could make a lie a truth for him. A white woman with a little white dog stopped and eyed me from the sidewalk. She seemed perturbed. Her leathery face and squinty eyes peering through the passenger side window had me on alert. What could she possibly want, I thought. I set the packed porcelain pipe back in the ashtray and rolled the window halfway down. Can I help you? I asked. Yeah, she started and fixed her gaze on the flag that hung from the clip of my rear view mirror. What is it with Puerto Ricans and their flags? She asked. I don't get it. This blood rushed to my face. Profanity lodged in my throat. I wanted to get out of the car. How was that question even asked? How was it answered? She waited. I breathed, closed my eyes, relaxed into my seat. I put my hands on the steering wheel. I breathed again and opened my eyes. I stretched my upper body to look over at the dog and when the dog raised its head toward me panting, I winked at it. Then I flashed a grin at its walker. Well, for one, it doesn't require a war to activate its national binding power, I said. She looked puzzled, tilted her head. The 1868 original served as the major fuck you to Spanish rule on the island in the town of Lares. I opened the window wider. We loved it then and forever because it meant our souls would never be colonized, though we had no idea how ominous the red, white, and blue would prove to be, you know what I'm saying? Her mouth opened to speak. I cut her off. We flew it again during the second major revolt against the Spanish in Yauco. That one was an adaptation created in 1895 by Puerto Rican exiles here in New York. I'm telling you, there's magic in its diasporic pull. Wait, what? She asked. It serves as a beacon for lost jibaros looking for love, rice and beans, and salsa, the dance, not the dip. I said, lifting the pipe to my lips, lighting it, and taking a long, deep toke. She shook her head and started walking off. I got out of the car and followed. 
If you fly the flag backward during a windstorm, you can hear the island's national anthem, La Borinquena, playing through the snaps. But you have to put your ear real close, like a seashell. I let out a cloud of smoke. You're crazy, she said, looking menaced. I'm calling the cops. When the island was turned over to the US like a prized mistress between colonial pimps after a high stakes poker game, law 53 made it illegal to fly the flag. Do you know how many of us were beaten and slaughtered over that flag until 1950 fucking seven when that bullshit gag law was repealed? Of course you don't. She retreated at a light trot, cell phone in hand, pressed to ear, the dog barked. Because the colors remind us of what we are and what we are not, I yelled. I stopped. I sat on the curb, hunched over, feeling hazy. Because we are the last colony and non-resistance is futile, I said to no one. I went back to my uncle's room. A doctor and nurse hovered over his lifeless body. An orderly unplugged him from technology. They spoke, but I couldn't hear. I was transfixed on Theo Jean's face, so beautiful and peaceful. My eyes traveled and locked on the one starred red, white, and blue flag I'd pinned above his headboard when they brought him here. I glided around the living and pulled it off the wall. I held it in my hand as tears swelled. I heard how sorry someone was. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce our next reader, Jaya Tripathi. Jaya Tripathi, after working in human rights for several years, Jaya trained and worked as a theater actor in New York until the pandemic put life as we know it on hold. He has been a student with the Writer Studio since 2018 and is deeply grateful for its community. The first poem is called Top 10 Reasons Why I Hate Yoga Class. One, because I hate spandex. Because if I have to work out, I'd rather dance it out to Blondie's Atomic in my living room. Because my calves are too tight for downward dog and my flow is staccato. Two, because it's not pronounced yoga, it's pronounced yog. Would it kill us to use a diacritic? Asking for a friend, language matters. But if you're reading this poem, you probably think so too. Three, because when I smell incense, my soul lifts in worship. But in 2008, Yoga Journal said, referring to Hinduism carried too much baggage, which is like when members of my South Asian feminist collective in college petitioned to remove the word feminist from our mission statement. It's like sister, then get out. Four, because when I was 11, my brothers and I had a tiny plastic Christmas tree. Not sure how we got it, but my father definitely did not approve. One Saturday, he gently snapped the tree in half and threw it away. I regretted the loss, but I relished my father's clarity on what we are and what we are not. Five, because turmeric lattes, excuse me, golden milk lattes are hip now, but how many jokes have you heard about curry smells? I've heard a few. Six, because you could say I have a chip on my shoulder and I'll make it easy for you and tell you that really it's a crack, a chasm, a canyon, a scar. And buried in that scar is Gwen Stefani in a bindi. I guess we should consider ourselves lucky we didn't get the Harajuku girls treatment. Seven, because Om is the sound of God, gods, the universe, creation, preservation, destruction, because I want you to have it, to hold it in your mind and your mouth and your belly, but I want you to hold it rightly, to see the root. Eight, because when Obama celebrated Diwali, I was so fucking happy, but hell, I was happy when Pottery Barn included Diwali in its holiday decorations website. Not as happy as I was when alternate side parking was suspended for the Wally. I see you, New York Department of Transportation. Nine, because your appreciation of my culture 
requires my acquiescence to its dilution. But if your appreciation of my culture requires its dilution, I find it is no appreciation at all. Because when we gave my aunt's body to the fire, the Gayatri Mantra was the only thing holding us up. 10. Because in the bucolic purple of East Tennessee, when I was six, another child asked me if I was a dot or a feather. In his pink skinned and gentle ignorance, I found no malice and it was easy to answer, what? Maybe he was there in January, a ruddy bearded man hanging from the balcony on the Senate floor, smearing vermilion on Zachary Taylor's mute face. I wonder how many of those rioters have ever taken a yoga class. Maybe one of them will even swear it did wonders for his sciatica. The second poem is called, If I'm Honest. If I'm honest, this cheery fever feels like a temporary insanity. I was safer in the country of control, doling out small pleasures to myself, like a wily jailer, like a Lucy peddler, like a guppy's sphincter. This morning I washed tiny newborn bloomers. There were no fates scuttling in the washing machine, no sheep livers on the drying rack. Later in the shower when I felt her moving like a bag of cats between my hip bone and my heart, I painted a cobweb of silly string around my fat belly, cupped my veiny breasts and crowed. Not long ago, I grew my certainty fresh every day like a liver, asked the doctors to look deep at the pieces of my child sparkling in my blood, her stars, her tattoo. I hummed, a Boy Scout is always prepared. My daughter heard me through my navel and laughed. Lying slathered in aspic, I clutched at every skeletal preview, each glimpse of augury fading too fast a stick of incense on a dark stair. I always wanted to be a mother, but I thought I'd be an armory, a phalanx, her still suit in a gray, shitty world. Instead, I see her hiccup on a monitor and I break open into sunshine completely. Thank you. <laughs>